we just thank you for your presence, God, that's in this place, for your joy that's in this place, Lord. And I just pray for every single person that's here to, today, God. Lord, I pray that you would fill them with your hope. I pray that you would fill them with your joy. I pray that you would fill them with their peace, that whatever it is that they may be going through, God, may they know, Lord, that you are with them, that you are for them. And I just feel like someone here needs to be reminded that God goes before you. That means that he goes in front of you. That means he goes behind you. He's on your left side. He's on your right side. And he's never left you. And so this is the perfect place to be in God's house this morning.
Jesus. Amen? Yes. Well, good morning, Elevate Church. My name is Jen. I have the pleasure of welcoming anyone that might be joining us for the first time. So when I count to three, I just want you to raise your hand, be loud and proud, don't be shy. We don't wanna embarrass you. It's just our way of connecting with you. One of our team members is gonna put a connect card in your hand. We just ask that you fill it out at the end of service. And then today you'll be taking it to the connect table that we have in our lobby. You're gonna exchange that for a free, or excuse me, for a golden guest ticket. And then when you come back next Sunday, weather permitting, our cafe will be open. You'll take it to our cafe and you're gonna exchange that for a free drink of your choice. Now, if you're joining us online for the first time, go ahead and type first into the comments so that we connect with you as well. Okay, don't be shy, raise your hand. One, two, three. Oh, even before I finish counting, welcome. Awesome. Just keep your hand up until we're able to get you that card. Thank you so much for being with us. At this time, I want to invite absolutely everybody, everybody, everybody to take out your cell phones. And I just want you to do two things. First, if you haven't done it already, scan the QR code that's on the screen behind me. That's going to get you connected to everything Elevate, our app, all of our social medias, our website. It'll just keep you up to date with everything that we have going on here at Elevate Church. And then once you're done with that, do us a really big favor, double check it, just make sure that it's on silent. We don't want you or your neighbor to be disturbed during today's message, all right? Now, I'm gonna share something with you guys. We all know that the Bible says that life and death are in the power of the tongue, right? But how many of us forget that when we're speaking to ourselves? I don't know about you guys, but if I'm in the middle of a task and I make a mistake or I mess up on something, I'm horrible to myself. Ugh, Jennifer, you're so stupid. You're so dumb. And I use my full name, like when your mom's yelling at you, I, I do that. But we need to start speaking life over ourselves, right? So here's what I would like you guys to do. I want you to turn to your neighbor, tell them hello, good morning. And then I want you to share two things that you are going to stop speaking over yourself. Ready, set, go. For those of you joining us online, let us know in the comments what are two words that you're going to stop speaking over yourself. Enjoy the service, and we hope that you can join us in person very, very soon. What is up, church? Let me tell you something. I am super proud of you guys. Let me tell you why. Because most Christians, and you're watching along as well, most Christians, you know, determine whether or not they're going to go to church based on the weather. So if it rains, Christians definitely do not like getting wet. If it's cold, Christians don't like getting it out of their covers. But you... You're different. You guys are different, man. I'm not kidding you. When you've been in church as long as I have 27 years in church, man, I'm telling you, there, there, there are just pockets that you just kind of know. But let me tell you something. This year, it's been different with, with you guys. You guys have been consistent. And, uh, and I know that God blesses consistency. So, you know, keep being consistent with your walk with God. If you're inconsistent, you're not going to have a consistent victory in your life. So remember that. Amen? All right. Uh, well, man, I'm excited about today's message. It jacked all of us up in a good way. So I want you to just tap your neighbor, you know, and just be like, he's going to talk about you today. And then you do the same thing to that person. Be like, no, I think he's talking about you today. It's going to be good. Listen, you came on a good day. This is going to be a good one today because I'm talking to me as well. And so, uh, but before we do that, let me uh, show you on the screen, Deuteronomy chapter 26. It says this, put some of the first produce from each crop you harvest into a basket and bring it to the designated place of worship. Where are you at today? The place of worship, right? The place the Lord your God chooses for his name to be honored. Now, you know, the biggest key is you first find the place that God has designated for you to do life and where you're going to worship him. You know, he says in this verse that when we bring or when we produce our crops, 
Mind you, back in those days, they didn't have, you know, dollars and quarters and checks and stocks and all this. The way they had currency back then was through their produce or whether it was carpentry, it was trade. That's what they did back then. And so this scripture reflects our finances. And so in the verse, he says, put some of the first produce. Ever say the first produce. It didn't say the last or the leftover. He says, bring the first produce, the first From each crop you harvest into a basket, right, and bring it to the designated place of worship and the place the Lord your God chooses for his name to be honored. Another form of worship beyond what we just did right now with singing to God, that was worship. But the other act of worship is when you worship God with your finances versus worshiping your finances rather God. And so in this basket, and there is, there's, there's 10 tangerines, or some of you call them cuties. I don't know what they're called. <laughs> and so this is what tithing is, just so you understand this. Because the biggest argument people always have, or the biggest temptation people always have, one of the big dogs, is finances. It's money. Most marriages are destroyed because of money. There's three top killers of marriages. One of them is money. Relationships are broken because of money. And so God says, hey, listen, um, when you come to me and you worship me, I want you to take, for example, you have 10 tangerines. And he says, and I want you to bring me a tenth. I want you to bring me one and worship me and honor me with it. And here's why. What is inside this fruit? Seeds. The Bible says that God gives seed to the one who sows. And so the fact that God is the source of the seed should tell you that everything I have belongs to him. Now, whether you believe that or not, that's on you. But at the end of the day, if you think it's all you, well, let God take your breath away, then what do you have? So is your life yours? It's a gift from him that he gave you life. And so the tithe, it it reminds you that I know who the source is of all my 10 oranges. I know who the source is of my health. I know who the source is of my wealth. I know who the source is of my peace. I know the source. And when you bring the tithe, and maybe some of you don't tithe at all, or you tithe. Maybe tip God instead of tithe to God. And so when you bring your tithe like we do, when you get paid, you come and you say, the first thing I do is I give to God what's his because I worship him with it. Because if you don't learn to trust God financially, then you're going to worship you. And so the tithe belongs to him. God's not even like, oh, my God, I'm so proud of you. No, that's obedience. I don't just give 10% to this church. I give offerings, so there's times where I come with two or three extra, like, for example, that kid's building, I have been giving money towards that. Projects around the world, I give towards that. That's called an offering. That's from my heart. This is my obedience. This is my heart. This is what comes out of what I want to do, above what belongs to him. I give him what's his, and then I give beyond. And why? Because, you know what? I know there's more seed where this came from and he's the source of everything and I have been tithing for 27 years and I believe him and I've tithed when it's been dry and I've tithed when it's been good a tithe just think about this what is 10% of one dollar the fact that you can't trust God with 10 cents so it's more of an argument it's more of this fight when it comes, this temptation when it comes about finances, money. And so I just encourage in 2024, you know what? If you've never been a tither and you've been a Christian forever and you just always argue, you know, do I got to pay back? No, just repent and start honoring your God and worship him and say, Father, forgive me for not trusting you. Forgive me for not realizing that everything is yours. Amen. So Father, we pray today that we would have the courage 
and the faith and the trust knowing that you are the source of all things, Father. And we pray that you would continue to use this house to change the world, to keep rescuing children at risk all over the globe, to keep preaching the gospel, to keep helping those that are in need. And we pray that you would continually give seed to the sower in Jesus' name. Amen. These are all the ways to give, by the way, EC, give to 77977, church app, website. But I just encourage you, 2024, say, you know what? I'm going to trust them with everything. And you watch and see what God would do. All right. Well, it's going to be a good service today. I'm going to be talking about your words. That's why Jennifer asked, you know, where are a few words that you need to stop saying over yourself? And uh, I think we can all admit that... We all say stupid things with our words, right? And people have said stupid things about us with their words. We have been hurt by the words of people, but we have also hurt people with our words. So let's not look all righteous and holy. You know, let's put all the halos away, all your wings away, because today we're talking to all of us. And there's this unknown poet who made a very wonderful quote which definitely has truth, whether or not their intention was, you know, to bring it to Christians, I doubt it, whether it was to bring uh, an interpretation of a Christian worldview, I doubt it. I think this poet was just a poet, came up with some really cool, cool words. And this poet said, words make worlds. And there's, there's truth to that. Words do make worlds. Words do shape your world. Words do shape your life. Words are powerful. And whether this person meant to be, you know, spiritual, I don't know. But I know that the Bible says in Proverbs 18, 21, that life and death is in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. It's amazing how we love the things we hate instead of loving the things that God wants us to embrace. Have you noticed that? Like the thing I don't want to do, I keep doing. The thing I need to do, I don't do it. That's what our words are like. I don't want to keep saying this about my situation. I don't want to keep speaking ill about myself or I don't want to keep hurting people with the words I speak to my spouse or to my children. But the thing that I hate to do is what I keep doing over and over again. Are you hearing me? Or whether, or whether it's you feeding on the words that were spoken over you. For example, I remember my Spanish teacher back in high school. Crazy lady. She was, she was, and she didn't like me, which I could understand why she didn't like me. I was, I was always one of those troubled kids. You know what I'm saying? Always acting up. So the sheriff's department would have to come to the school, put me out of class. I was one of those bad boy kids. And so my Spanish teacher said, you know what? You're, 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 you'll never amount to anything. And she says, and you know what, Mauricio, you're just gum under a shoe. And of course, you know, when you're a kid, you think you're all bad, right? I'd be like, oh, blankety blank, blank, you know? dropping down them curse bombs. But when I would leave that classroom, I would meditate on the words that woman said about me. And those words had power to create a feeling inside of me, though I acted like words don't hurt me. No, words hurt everybody. It's like that old saying, sticks and stones will never hurt. Anybody remember that, that old saying? Thank you so much. We got it. So here's the truth. That is stupid. Words hurt. And we all have said hurtful words. Tap your neighbor say, I think he's talking about you. Okay. If they're looking at you weird, just, then you can just be like, he's talking to both of us. Now... I think that when this poet wrote this, whether the intention was for believers or not, it doesn't matter. But when I open my Bible to the very first page of the book, we see that God created earth 
and he created the heavens. That's what the scripture says. Now, mind you, when God created the earth, he didn't create the world with his hands. He didn't create the heavens or the earth with any materials. He didn't go to Home Depot or Best Buy or, or Lowe's or any. He didn't, go, he didn't need anything to create. All God said in the beginning was, and God said, and then whenever God said something, it would just happen. God said, let there be light, and there was. And light is still what? It's still traveling. Light has not stopped. That means that when God speaks, there's something powerful that should connect with your life and my life. That when we speak, sometimes the reason you're still in depression or still in anxiety or still living in fear, still living in doubt is because you keep speaking that. And so when you keep speaking, I'm dumb, I'm stupid, I'm not good enough, whether it's because someone didn't see your worth or whether you don't see your worth, when you keep saying that, let me tell you something, you're still speaking that into existence throughout your life. That's the power of our words. And so in John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, it says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made. How many things were made? All things were made. So just think about your life right now. You are who you are and you are what you do because all things were created by you. Are you here with me today? I hope that wasn't confusing. Another one, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, right? But what comes out of your tongue is coming out of your heart. And so he says, and so, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. And without him, there is no restoration. Without him, there is no redemption. Without him, there is no healing. If you keep speaking you without him, you're going to keep producing you results. If you keep speaking the things that have been lies about you, then guess what? You're going to continue to eat the fruit of that, and that's what you're producing. Just like this seed does not produce apples. It produces according to its kind. So whatever you keep speaking, you're producing according to what you say. If you say you're not good enough, guess what? You're not good enough. If you keep saying, I can't do that, well, guess what? You can't do that. If you say, I can never own a house, I could never afford a house, well, guess what? You're probably right. You'll never afford a house. Not because you can't, but because you have decided to believe what you say. It's become, listen, your words, your words become your beliefs. Your beliefs become your behaviors. But it, it's all tied back to what you say or what other people said about you. But I don't think people have that much power. They only have the power we give it. You and I fuel whatever it is that we want to fuel. And so how you are today, how I am today, because we're all messed up people. You all know that, right? Like there is no perfect person in this room. We're just a ball of mess up in this house. We're messy. And we are who we are, whether good or bad, because of the consequences of what we've said about ourselves. For example, you know, some of you, you're right now enjoying your purpose and calling with confidence because of what someone said and spoke into your life. For example, Elevate Church, honestly, it exists because my mentors saw something I didn't see in me. They said, you would be a great pastor. And I said, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> you are going to bring thousands of people to Christ. I don't think so. But because they kept saying it and saying it, and I finally, finally started believing what they were saying, Elevate Church was birthed. 
So some of you right now, you're an entrepreneur, you're a business owner. Some of you, you're, you're living out your calling, you're living out your purpose in whatever it is you do. And, and that's because someone saw the potential and said, or you have a great marriage now. Maybe it was rocky, maybe it was a mess, but someone kept speaking life into you and, and kept building you up, kept, kept stirring up the flame within you, right? And they kept believing in you. And now you can attribute your success to someone that has literally spoken that into existence, into your life. And now you're producing the results of what someone said, which is great. I think we can all agree to that. But there's also others that are sitting in this room right now that you have insecurities. You lack confidence. You lack self-worth. You lack, you have fear, doubt, unbelief. But that may be because of a experience that you had growing up where people said things about you that you actually hung your life on. And because you're hung up on those words, you seem like I can't get out of that or you have allowed that to create the person you are today, not realizing that there is a way out. There is an exit for that right now. And God is presenting that exit to us today saying, guess what? You have the power of life and death in your mouth. And it always, you know, I trip out because, you know, there's people I follow that are not Christians that are great, successful people that I just enjoy. I enjoy business. I love all that stuff. And I hear them speak, and they're, trust me, they're far away from God. They'll drop their F-bombs and everything, but it's like fish, right? You eat the meat, spit out the bones, right? But I can give you a, a, a verse for every single Bible verse, for everything that comes out of the mouth. And I think to myself, like, these people are so successful because they're applying the principles of God's word without them even knowing. Now, I'm sure they heard it from someone else, but someone had to say it. And, and, and once they heard someone say it, they hung on to those words, and then now they're producing and they're benefiting from the fruit of those words because they're not just saying it, now they believe what they say. And oftentimes we don't believe what we say. And if you don't believe what, what you say, then that's going to be very difficult for you to see the outcome of a great victory. For example, if next week is Super Bowl Sunday, don't miss church. We're going to have a great time, I promise you. We're going to transform this place, but the word's going to be solid. You're going to love it. But next week when the Niners, boo, and the Kansas City, you know, play, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you who I'm going for. I won't do that. I don't want to divide this house. <laughs> but uh, it's okay. My team's not in. You know, whatever. Um, but when they go in the locker room next weekend, they're not going to, the coach is not going to come in there and be like, hey, guys, I hope we win today. I really do hope we make it because have you seen the size of their team? Some, they got some big boys. The coach doesn't walk in there and, and walk with a mindset of speaking words of doubt and fear and insecurity. No, when the coach walks in there, man, he's walking in there like they're champions already. They're telling them, we are the champions. We're, we're going to hit that field. We're going to crush them. We're going to run them over. Man, we're going to come in there and we're going to be on top. They'll even create a score. Right, they're gonna be like, we're gonna win, you know, 26 to 13 or or 40 to 28 or something. They come so confident by what they say. They're not walking into the locker room hoping that they're gonna win. No, they walk into the locker room declaring a victory before they have the victory. And we have to start talking like we have the victory. But Pastor, you don't know what I'm going through. That's your problem. You keep talking about what you're going through. And if you keep talking, now I'm not saying deny what you're going through. I'm just saying, what are you fueling? You have to wake up every day and tell yourself, I'm a child of God. Man, I am highly favored. As you're watching there in your living rooms or wherever you're watching from, I'm speaking to you as well. You have to begin to look at yourself and say, you know what? And let's say you've had a week of just depression. Say, today I'm going to live out joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I know my daughter was saying, come on, say this to me. Half of you are like, the joy of the Lord is... You don't believe it. Why? Because they're just words. 
And words will never produce something until you get that seed of the word in your heart and you start, I may not believe it right now, but let me tell you something, but I'm on my way. I'm on my way. Just like healing. I may be sick right now in body, but guess what? I've been quoting his word. I've been speaking his word. And eventually my healing's going to go. Amen. It's going to come. I'm going to see the breakthrough. But so often we're expecting instant gratification, instant miracle, instant breakthrough, which I believe in, but not everything is instant. Sometimes there's a process. And that process starts with changing your words. Come on, slap your neighbor. Say, I think he's talking to you now. Not me. You. And so regardless whether someone spoke to you, someone spoke about you, or someone spoke around you, it don't matter what happened. And I'm not trying to be mean-hearted because, I trust me, even as a pastor, I've had people in the church talk junk. But I could hang my life on their words, or I can go ahead and know that Jesus already hung on a cross, and he canceled those words. And some of you have become a better spouse, a better person, a better son, a better daughter, better father, better mother, because someone spoke truth to you. But it doesn't matter how much truth I speak to you. It doesn't matter how many pearls I throw at you. Let me tell you something. I can't convince you. You can go to therapists, counselors, you can sit down with your mother, your father, your grandmother, your grand. You can go to anyone who's going to drop some wisdom bombs on you. But let me tell you something. At the end of the day, the pearls can be beautiful, but unless you start learning to believe those words, nothing's going to change. No one can do that for you. And so we have to learn how to cancel those words because they're powerful. And I know that sometimes words are connected to a memory of something that caused you trauma. And, and, and you know what? And I'm not here to cancel that. I'm just saying that you can cancel that. Because memories are real. Pain is real. Hurt is real. I'm not denying that. But how many years are you going to live off those words how many years are you going to keep eating that and swallowing that and thinking about that and meditating on that? How many more years will you stay bitter, resentful, angry, upset? How, how much longer will you talk about what she said, what he said, what he... How long will you go the rest of your life putting your entire, your entire mental, you know, peace, you know, on, on, on the feet of dirt... That's just going to go ahead and step all over it and, and come to the conclusion that there's a better word for me and his name is Jesus and he does heal and he does redeem and he does forgive. Are you hearing me? And so um, some of us still might be dealing with this as a current issue where you keep reliving that trauma. Maybe it was something that happened as a child and that makes total sense when, when you're a child, you're innocent. But guess what? When you're innocent as a child, you couldn't protect yourself. And maybe you couldn't make a decision. But now as a grown person, as a grown adult, you have the power to choose now. They can't have power over you anymore. And so when you look at the scripture in James chapter 3, I want you to follow along with me very carefully. Because James begins to break it down very good for us and what the issue is. In James chapter 3, verse 2, we'll read all the way through verse 10. Listen to this carefully. James says, indeed, we all make many mistakes. So he's already, you know, calling it real. He's like, we're all full of mistakes. He says, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves. So in other words, you want to learn how to control yourself? Start with your tongue. He says, if we could do that, in other words, he's saying, we're all going to stumble. We're not perfect at this. And even after this message, I promise you, you're probably going to stumble today at lunch or dinner, whatever. He says, 
We could control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go. That tells me that my tongue chooses where I want to go. Even though the winds are strong, in the same way the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire. Come on, are you unhappy with life? The tongue has been setting that, that journey on fire. For it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil. This tongue is restless, huh? It always has something to say. Full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father. And sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image and likeness of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. The same mouth. You're in here looking all holy. We're singing to God, right? And then we go out, curse someone off. With the same mouth. Aren't you glad that God gave us two eyes, two ears, but only one mouth? Help us, Lord, if you gave us two mouths. <laughs> Some of you a little extra, extra, amen? <laughs> two legs, two arms, but one mouth. And, and so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers sis, and sisters, this is not right. It's not right. So in other words, what James is basically pointing out in these verses, and then I'm going to give you three points to go over real quickly. He, he is pointing out that we all have a problem with taming this tongue, all of us, including me. We all have a problem. James said that the tongue, based on the scripture, is full of poison. This tongue is full of poison. We're like vipers. And it's evil. And it brings corruption even to our own body. I think that sometimes we talk ourselves more into sickness than talk ourselves out of sickness and disease. Yes? I, I think we talk ourselves more into depression rather than talking ourselves out of it. So you and I have the power to, to talk ourselves into victory and into peace, which I'm sure if you deal with depression, and my family has, I get it. I understand it. I've seen it. It's not pretty. But, but I have experienced seasons where I feel depressed, but I have learned that I have to literally begin to combat the depression, combat the sadness, combat the fear, not with my words, but with his words. Because you can't fight your words with your words. You can't fight your thoughts with your thoughts. You can't tell your thoughts, stop it, stop it, stop it. Don't think like that no more. Don't think like that no more. Don't say that no more. Let me tell you something. You're going to say it again. You have to fight your thoughts with God's word. And the way you fight that is when you start bringing God's word into your life, you start renewing the way you think. You change the way you think. And so James said that the tongue is full of poison and it sets the course of your life, my life, it sets it on fire. But not just any fire. He says hellfire. So to say that our mouths set our life on fire by hell is to say that there are times when our tongue participates with the devil. Where our tongue comes in agreement with the devil. As a matter of fact, we really don't need to know what the devil sounds like or even how to recognize his voice. All you have to do is pay attention on how you talk to other people and yourself and the devil's right there. Think about it. How many arguments do you have with people? How much quarreling do you have? How many, how many fights do you have amongst yourselves? If you want to know the voice, the, the, recognize the, 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 the voice of the devil, just listen to what you're saying about people. Listen to what you're saying about yourself. That, my friend, that's the devil. 
That's what James is saying. So you don't have to fear. I wonder what the devil sounds like. Just keep talking. Can I get an amen? amen. Come on. Yeah. We, we're more acquainted with the voice of the devil than the voice of God. Because Jesus said, listen, my sheep know my voice. And the voice of a stranger, they won't follow. Y'all better start reading your word. No scripture, okay? I was hoping we were going to end it together. <laughs> Y'all left me hanging. He says, my, my sheep know my voice. And the voice of a stranger, they will not follow. But what do we follow? The stranger's voice. Okay, I better hurry up. Some of you look a little confused. That's okay. <laughs> Let me bring it to you in these terms. Peter, a righteous man, loves God. Imperfect person, definitely. But think about it. A disciple of Jesus is rolling with Jesus. And Jesus starts telling Peter, hey, Peter, I'm going to die for the world. The sins of this world, I will be arrested. I'm going to die on a cross. But don't worry, because on the third day, I'll be raised from the dead. Peter had the audacity to say, stop saying you're going to die. You're going to die. You're not going to go down self-righteous. Don't talk like that again. Immediately, Jesus stops in his tracks and he looks at Peter and he says, he attributes his words to Satan because he looks at Peter and he says, Satan, get behind me. So you can be a disciple. You can be someone who loves God. We love God in this house. We all love God in this house. And yet, though you're a follower of Jesus, maybe based on this story with Peter and Jesus, maybe some of our words attribute Satan's words. And Jesus is rebuking the church saying, get behind me, Satan, because that's not me. Amen? So if it can happen to a Peter, it can happen to us. So you may think you mean well, but let me tell you something. Maybe you don't mean well. And we need to start speaking what God said. And so uh, James points out three things. Number one, we all stumble in our words. If we could control our tongue, we would be perfect. That's good news because number one tells me that, whew, at least James knows that we are not good at this. The second thing he talks about in this story, which I'll focus on, the tongue is powerful. And the third thing that he says here is that the tongue is inconsistent. And... Let's start with the tongue is powerful because we already know that we're messed up in what we, what we say. He said in the verse, and among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world. Look at that. It is a what? A whole world. It's a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life. Can you imagine that? Your words can set your whole life on a trajectory of joy. Not happiness, because happiness is temporary, but joy. Your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. This means that when we have control of our tongue, then we'll have control of this whole body. Think about that. If I can just control my tongue, then I can control where my feet go. I can control where my eyes go. I can control where my thoughts go. Because isn't your thought life part of your body? It's in your mind, right? So you would start controlling how you think. And so in Joshua 1.8, because we tend to meditate on all kinds of negative things so often. That's just like the nature of a broken humanity. But Joshua 1.8 says this, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. In other words, if you don't know scripture, and please, yes, come hear the sermons, come hear the speakers here, do all that. That's, you need that. But you can't just take my word and go home and then do nothing with it. You have to open this book of the law and you have to go ahead and do what the scripture says. He says, this book of the law shall not depart from your, but you shall 
Meditate on it day and night so that you may be what? Careful to do according to all that. In other words, the only way you're going to be careful with your tongue is until you start knowing this. Then you'll be able to line up with what you say and what, what God said. But if you don't know what God said, then you're going to keep taking what everybody else said. And he says, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Now, he's not talking about money here, people. He's not talking about like, oh, then you're going to blow it up and be rich, and man, you're going to be amazing, and you're going to be an influence. No, 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 no. He's talking about your soul will stop being bankrupt. You'll start being spiritually broke. There's nothing worse than just to keep having the title Christian, but never being a full believer and live the rest of your, your whole life not knowing who Jesus is. He says, then you'll make your way. Ever see my way. You know what my way is, what your way is? It's your behavior. Your ways will be prosperous. How you act, how you behave, how you think. Once again, we're not perfect, right? So don't start looking at yourself like, you see, I told you your way is wrong. Like, don't do that. And then you'll have good success. And so we have the power to undo. We have the power to cancel. We have the power to destroy every word that has been spoken about us, that has been spoken to us, or that has been spoken around us. I can't control what everybody says. I could only control what I say. Because someone always has something to say. But I can't keep hanging my life on what they said. I need to hang my life on the finished work of the cross. Are you hearing me? And, and it's interesting because who would think that the overall person, our growth, our progress, our healing, our success, our blessings, our cursings, our thoughts, our holiness, our restraint, our wisdom. It all is linked to our tongue. All of it. All of it is linked to our mouth. Just think about the power. That's what James is saying. Because he says, your whole life, your whole life will be created. Your world will be created and framed by what you say. And so the final point is our words are inconsistent. Inconsistent. I don't think any of us here are consistent with our words, but we're, we're always working on it, right? Let me show you so that this. This is very good. Last, last two verses and we're done. Matthew 8, verses 5 through 10 says this. And when he had entered Capernaum, meaning Jesus, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. So there's a circumstance. And he said to him, I will come and I'll heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. And of course, I'm sure this man had his own own reasons because he was a Roman soldier. Romans had issues with, you know, religious people, but yet this man was different. He believed in this Jesus. He says, I'm not worthy that you come under my roof, but only say the word. Say it with me, but only say the word. Think about that. Just, just say it. I don't need you to come. Just tell me my servant is going to be well. Just say that my servant is going to be healed. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. Notice he didn't say, just say it and it might happen. Just say it and I hope your words work. Just say it and let's roll the dice and see if you are who you say. No, he said, just say it and I know. That my servant will be made well. A lot of us don't know what he said. He says, for I too am a man under authority. Ever say under authority. Under authority. 
Because here's the truth. Right now, wherever you're at, whatever your world looks like, you're under that authority. And you're either under the authority of hell or you're under the authority of heaven. So if you want to be free today, you have to come come up from being under the authority of the devil and come back under the authority of Christ, who is the chief shepherd. He says, for I am a man under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. He says, man, I have been rolling with all you people, and in all of Israel, A Roman soldier out of all people who understands the power of authority actually gets this. One guy who actually understands the power of coming under because he realizes that he also has people under him. And and he, listen, the Roman soldier basically, he got his Words in alignment with God's word. There's feedback, please. And and when he did that, that's when things started happening. He didn't say, go to my house. He said, your word is enough. And sometimes you and I, me too, we go to people for counsel. And they give us good advice, good counsel, good direction. But let me tell you something. It don't matter how many people you go to. No one can convince you. Just like no one can convince me at this point in my walk that there is no God. You can't convince me that he's not real. Why? Because I have tasted and I have seen the goodness of God and nothing can change that. Why? I am fully convinced Some of you out there, you're not convinced. You're inconsistent with your faith. And when you're inconsistent with your faith, you'll be inconsistent with your walk. And when you're inconsistent with your walk with God, your life will look like this. Where God's trying to get you like this. You can keep changing lanes and races. And you can change all you want. But let me tell you something. The finish line remains the same so you better get your words in alignment with his words and run your race and cross the finish line amen come on he said he marveled he marveled at this man's faith i want heaven to look down here at elevate church and be like man them people they're faith people man like man they come in and they worship me and they believe me their worship shows me they believe me Their faith shows me they trust me. Their faith says, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. That's how we have to approach heaven. Not perfect. Not perfect. Remember, we're all messy. But God knows how to make messy and make messages out of them. Come on, God knows how to take testings and make testimonies out of them. Right? God knows how to take our junk Right? And bring some funk. Right? No, no, none of that. Right? <laughs> that, that didn't sound right. Okay, that was, yeah, that was, that was off the cuff. That was bad. Okay, my bad. I won't do that again. <laughs> Sorry, Frank. <laughs> you know what I mean by funk, right? Like, play that funky music. No, that wasn't good either. <laughs> okay. I already erased all that. All right, rewind, rewind. I'm saying some dumb words right now. <laughs> so, so what am I saying? I'm saying um, no one can convince you. But this guy, this soldier, this Roman centurion, he was fully convinced that his word was enough. Fully convinced. And as you look at this story and understand the power of authority, in verse 13 of Matthew 8, which they're putting up on the screen right now, It says, 
Then Jesus, this is after everything. And he goes into a whole lot of conversations, so we have to skip down. Then Jesus said to the Roman officer, go back home. Ever say, go back home. That's what I'm praying for you. Go back home because you believed. It has happened. And the young servant was healed that same hour. So sometimes your healing is going to be instant. And sometimes your healing is going to be in your going. Maybe you, you have some deep trauma, but let me tell you something. You need to start replacing your words with his. But, but stop the butt. Everybody's got a big butt. Everybody. But stop the butt. You know what I've taught myself? Because I used to say but. I taught myself this. Now, I always say, however. Why? But makes excuses. However is a comma. However. I'm angry. However. I'm going to get over myself. Amen? Amen? You know, well, the reason I'm not doing, you know, but, but stop your big butt. However, I'm going to get up and I'm going to do what God's called me to do. And I'm going to believe what he said. And I love this because Jesus said, because you believed, it already happened. And so I pray that as you leave today, that you leave believing that his word is enough. Bow your head, close your eyes. Heavenly Father, I pray for those watching online and those in this room. And I pray that heaven would fill every mind and every heart with peace. Lord, I know that we all go through seasons of torment, suffering, pain. I know that we all go through seasons where thoughts of, of giving up, quitting, thoughts of failure, thoughts of fear, anxiety. Lord, I know those are all real things, but you're more real than all of them. And so, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that, that we would have the courage to take every thought captive, every word captive, every lie captive, and that we would have the boldness to bring it to the feet of Jesus. And so, Father, I pray that you would, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come alive in us as we give you permission to bring conviction to us when we speak. Lord, help us to be aware of the words we say, that we would be attentive, that we would cancel the moment we say something negative, even if it's like, oh, I can never afford that. Okay, no, Lord. I repent, I cancel that. No, I will. I will, I can. And so, Lord, I pray that we would exchange our words for your better word. And I pray that you would do great miracles, healing in families, healing in relationships, healing amongst your church. Lord, that we would push away quarreling and arguing and that we would come to the place of rest knowing that Jesus is king over this tongue Jesus is Lord over our tongue and I pray if there's anyone in this room that has never said Jesus forgive me of my sins whether you're online or in this room if you have never said Jesus save me what do, you, what do I need saving from pastor hell because hell is a real place. And if you've been playing religion, like, okay, I just go when I feel sad, that's religion. A relationship is you and God start having fellowship more often. Jesus didn't die for religion. He died for a personal relationship with you. And so if you're in this room and you've never had a real raw relationship with Jesus, I'm going to ask you in a few moments to lift your hand at the count of three. And you're basically lifting your hand and you're going to say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Save my soul. 
The Bible says this. Here's what Jesus said. He says, if, if you confess me with your mouth and if you believe me with your heart, I will save you. So today, you have to confess with your mouth and you have to believe in your heart that God is not angry at you. God is not mad at you. God is not annoyed with you. God does not hate you. He loves you. So at the count of three, with every eye closed, every head bowed, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand if you want to receive Christ today. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer that you're going to say, and you're going to invite heaven in. Ready? Don't be afraid. Don't be nervous. One, two, three. If that's you, lift that hand high in the air, high in the air. I see those hands. Thank you. Thank you. I see those hands. Thank you. You could put them down online. Type the word life on the comments so that our team can pray as well. Let's all pray this together. Ready? Everyone at the count of three. One, two, three. Jesus. Today I say that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Please forgive me of all my sins. And today I say that without you, I can't live with the life that you have chosen for me. Today I say that I receive the forgiveness of my sins and your precious Holy Spirit. Lead me and guide me all the days of my life. I'm born again, saved and set apart for your holy purposes. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap, come on. Well, I hope you got something out of this today. Uh, let me give you a few announcements tomorrow. I would say tomorrow. Okay, so we've been teaching our church how to read their Bible. And we did a 101 class. We did it all last year. We're doing it this year again. And uh, if you want to really learn how to read your Bible, how do, I, how do I create a devotion time? We don't just sit around in a circle and just talk. We give you tools. And so tomorrow is 202. We already did 101. Tomorrow's 202. We have a men's and a women's, and they have their own groups. So sign up on our church app or our website so we know who's coming, and, uh, and that way it allows us to prep for you. So that's tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m., Monday, 6.30 p.m. Also, Super Bowl Sunday, bring a family member, bring a friend. We are not boring at Elevate Church, man. We go all out. We have fun. And so um, there is someone that needs to hear you say, come with me. And they'll come, and I promise you heaven will touch them. Also, we're going to have all kinds of, you know, you know, photo booths, fun activities. I think they have all kinds of stuff, and uh, we're going to have a really good time. Also, circuit riders, okay, there is, we are hosting circuit riders. What circuit riders? They are a worship group that are doing a tour. They're on tour right now called uh, Carry the Love. And so this is for, um, you know, young adults ages 15 